In business leadership and management, what does it take to get ahead of the curve? Well, in the 70s, 80s and even early 90s, perhaps, the answer was an MBA. Yet after a prolific expansion of business schools and courses right around the world, the return on investment of many MBAs became much less attractive. Well, today in Australia sees the launch of a new MBA program by Sydney University in this very competitive space. And I'm joined in the studio now by the new dean of the Sydney Business School, Professor Geoffrey Garrett. Geoffrey, welcome to the program. My pleasure. Now, you've got recruitment firm uh, Corn Ferry on board in a partnership for this. You talk about a, a reimagined MBA. What does an executive um, three years into the workforce, which I think is what, what you're looking for, going to get for his $60,000 bucks? Well, I think, Tiki, the, you know, the big story for MBAs today is that employers and would-be MBA students want exactly the same thing. They want a mix of technical professional skills that we've always had, finance, uh, management, marketing, but they want that stuff that we used to call soft skills that I think is so important we can't call them soft anymore. Critical thinking, communication, collaboration, all the stuff that really makes for leaders. It used to be the easy side of the MBA. Uh, yeah, as I said, soft skills was so disparaging. What we now know is that everything in the business world, and in fact in nonprofits and in government, is about teamwork and leadership. So I think you've got to build that into the MBA from the ground up, which is what we've done. Well, I was going to say, how has the MBA thinking uh, changed post financial crisis? Because that, that there is a view that, of course, uh, Harvard MBAs uh, were a contributor to the financial crisis. Well, of course, so, you know, Harvard MBAs have done a lot of other stuff. You know, Mitt Romney is now running for president as a Republican candidate. Um, Tony Berg, Mark Johnson, David Clark essentially founded Macquarie Bank in Australia on the back of Harvard MBAs. But, you know, I think in the post financial. But did Gordon Gecko have an MBA? Well, I, you know, Hollywood's a whole different story, <laughs> of course. But, you know, Hollywood and uh, Wall Street mm -hmm. are, were essentially incredibly innovative industries that were just scaled up massively by technology. So I think, you know, the, the obvious way to to think about the post-GFC world is, gee, it was uh, those evil uh, MBA-educated Wall Streeters who caused it. But I don't think that's actually the right way to think about it. I mean, what's happened is that we're now living in this globalised, technology-enabled, winner-take-all world. Yeah. And if people make bad decisions, their effects can be multiplied. But, of course, the positive consequences of good decisions are equally multiplied. OK, so you talk about technology, and, and I think you rightly identify this online assault of the, of the virtual classroom. Your response is, is back to the future, uh, Oxford and Cambridge-style tutorials, Harvard and Yale-style seminars. Now, that means the teaching, presumably, face-to-face -face, face teaching, has to be top class. Do you have um, you know, the, the, the Tom Eisenmans from Harvard and, 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 and the Huggy Rouse from Stanford? Have you got that sort of quality? Do you yeah, think? of course, you know, we are in a world of winner-take-all markets, so mm -hmm. these big global names in uh, MBA education everyone knows about and everyone mm -hmm. wants. But I think the key really is for us to focus on what is still going to be unique about the in-class experience. And I think it's, it's the people, it's the interaction, not only teachers student but among the students as well so I think we've got to think about MBA teachers not as teachers as we used to think about them but rather as facilitators of learning where it's really about investing in our students to realize their ambitions that's the big story rather than just disseminating pure knowledge you mentioned a couple of, of MBA pinups, if you like. I have to say, the, the MBA um, graduate that I think about immediately is, is Fred Hilmer um, at Fairfax, now at AGSM. And I think Fairfax is going to be a case study, probably, on your course. Well, of course, uh, you know, the media industry has been transformed. And you know, it'd be pretty hard to find a global leader in media who's looking good today. You know, even Rupert Murdoch, of course, is having his own challenges. But, mm. you know, if you look at Fred Hilmer's career, not only has he got AGSM and now Vice Chancellor of University of New South Wales, he was also the head of McKinsey in Australia. Now, that's yeah. a pretty good record. Oh, you're the very good to defend the opposition there. Well, 
<laughs> Fred's an impressive person. Yeah, yeah, he is indeed. Um, can I ask you, uh, lastly, moving away from, from MBAs for a moment, I know you've just come off a plane from North America, from Canada. Foreign investment and Chinese foreign investment is so important. We've got this huge deal, Sinook yeah. looking to take over Nexum, the, 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 the oil and gas company. Uh, you obviously see this as a very significant moment, don't you? Yeah, I think it's a massive moment. You know, while Australian politicians were beating each other up over hypotheticals about Chinese investment, the Canadian government's going to face probably the biggest decision where China's concerned that's happened in the business world. They've got a struggling oil and gas company. Sinook has come in and made an all-cash 15 billion, 60 percent premium bid mm -hmm. for Nexon. The, the Canadian government is going to have to decide either we're not going to do this because it's a state-owned enterprise or we are going to do it even though it's a state-owned enterprise. Either decision, I think, will be globally important. So do you think that Australian decision makers and FERB will look at that very closely, that Wayne Swan will be looking at that very yeah, closely? Yeah, well, you know, the, the interesting thing about FERB is that the biggest decision it took was a non-decision. It didn't rule in the Chinalco 20% takeover of Rio. It essentially it sat in its hands and let the market dissolve that deal. I don't think that's going to be, that option is going to be available in Canada. So the Canadians are going to have to say, you know, we, we, we don't like Chinese state-owned investment because they've got an unfairly low cost cost of capital. We don't like it because they're pursuing national foreign policy objectives. Yeah. Either way, I think it's going to be a tough decision, but it's yeah. probably a decision that FERB in Australia one day soon will have to make itself. Indeed. Professor Geoffrey Garrett, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Tiki.